it has been said that uh, when God gets a hold of your money, that's when he, uh, that's when you're really saved. <laughs> and there is, uh, there is definitely some, uh, some truth to that. Uh, sometimes we think, okay, well, I'll surrender my life to God, but at the same time, I really want to use certain things in my life my own way. Um, I want to be in control of, you know, um, anything that happens during the work, work week, anything that happens um, with my family, uh, any kind of conflicts I'm in, or um, my finances and all that. I want to be in control of all of those things. But somehow, I, you know, God can have maybe my Sunday morning. And uh, as we mature in Christ, we learn to just kind of let those things go. So first off, tithing, uh, this was part of the membership course, but sometimes people don't really get uh, the full idea of it. So uh, obeying God is rewarded with God's blessings. That's just a way of life. Um, there are some people who would tell you that if you pay tithes, that you're going to get uh, super blessed. You know, God's going to open up the the floodgates of heaven and, and you're going to have so much money that you can you're going to be rolling around in your money and that's not how tithes works tithes does not work as a i put some in and god gives me a, it's not like a, a rewards program at a bank it's not like that but when you obey god god does bless you in life see god told us to tithe 10 percent of our money and so when we obey him he blesses us and when we don't obey him he withholds blessing um so with that being said, is there a blessing that comes from tithing? Well, yes, but not necessarily the blessing that we're always looking for. See, we think, I'm going to pay tithes, and then bada boom, bada bing, God's going to make my finances overflow, and that's not how it works. See, God gave us uh, rules and instruction about how to manage our money, and uh, we can't just be foolish with our money and then expect for God to give us blessing upon blessing. So the tithe is 10% of the income. This is before taxes. So whatever you actually paid is 10% of that. See, because if you take, um, if you do 10% off of what you what your check is, um, it'll be, uh, well, you know, substantially less. And um, so, you know, hey, if you're paying the government, you should probably be paying God. And once again, don't get too worried about it. Oh, I can't do that. One piece at a time. How about this? How about you start off paying 5%, and then you go 10%, and then you go 10% before taxes. And, uh, you know, if you gradually do that, you start realizing that, you know what, I can't do this. If I just stop wasting my money here, I can re-look, I can, I can change how I'm dealing with my money, I can change how I'm spending it, and I can manage, tax, I can ma manage my tithes. Sometimes, me, sometimes it hurts me to have to pay tithes, you know, because you're like, oh man, I... I could really use this money, but the truth is your money isn't your own, and God told you to spend some of that money for his kingdom, and that's by giving to your church. Um, once again, don't feel like this is a pastor telling you something. This is something that the Bible says, and I, as a pastor, I also tithe 10% of everything that I make. Um, so there's that. Um, it's off the top. That means it's you pay tithes before you do anything else and it's given as a priority uh, that means um, in your life you you work around this you, you kind of make it work in Malachi chapter um, 3 verses 8 through 11 it says will a man rob God yet you are robbing me but you say how have we robbed you in tithes and offering and you can read through the rest of there um, on your own but the fill in the blank there uh, given as a priority. Priority is the fill in the blank. Um, so then the next one, uh, it's given to the church to support ministers and to teach the fear of the Lord. The two basic ideas for paying for paying, uh, giving tithes, the first is to provide for God's uh, servants, uh, pastors, and uh, the cost that it, that it the, the cost of running a building uh, to pay for the ministries. Like uh, if you have a youth program, stuff like that. Um, see, people, we, we want our church to have good youth programs and good kids programs, but we don't actually want to have to volunteer to help, uh, help out at the special events, give financially. But see, that's that's our responsibility as a, as a family. Um, 
we are Christ's body. We're a family. So, uh, and then the rest, and then the other big idea in Scripture about paying tithes is to teach us to fear God. In other words, um, you obey what you fear. <laughs> and uh, when you are to fear the Lord, and especially as it applies to money, is God said to do this, and so I'm going to do what he said. Um, I could get more into the fear of the Lord, but I feel like that's a whole sermon, and this is not Sunday. This is a discipleship class, so I'm just going to cut it short there. Deuteronomy chapter 14, starting in verse 22 through 23, says, You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear uh, the Lord your God always. Um, so a big part there is to teach the fear of the Lord. Um, my finances belong to God. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> there is no fill in the blank on that one. Uh, this command was given apart from the law and includes uh, more than money. So the fill in the blank there, up, given apart from the law, the fill in the blank is law, and includes more than just money. Um, it uh, In Genesis 14... What I mean by more than just money, you should give of your time, volunteer for ministry, for instance. You should give of um, your money, obviously. You should give of your resources. Maybe you don't have money. Maybe you do have money. It doesn't matter. It really matter. Do you have something else that you can use? Maybe you have a skill or um, you just have something lying around your house that could be used for something. Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Now, I'm not saying hand it off to someone else and tell them to use it. I'm saying you use it. Genesis 14, 18 says, it says and, Melch and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God, uh, of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. And so here we see, before the law was ever given, the law, uh, the, uh, the tithe was uh, was taught. It was, in, it was taught in the law as well. And then after the law, it was still continued in practice. Um, so, next up, offering. Now, isn't an offering the same as a tithe? No. Um, there, there's tithes and then there's offerings. Tithes is 10% required. An offering is anything more than that 10%. Um, once again, an offering um, should be given from your time, from your resources, and from your money. It should be more than that. Not for the sake of making a um, pastor rich for the sake of being used in God's kingdom. See, there are a lot of corrupt uh, people on TV, like televangelists, and they give a bad name to pastors. You know, there's some pastors who have an excess of money but don't, won't use it to help people. And that's a shame. But that doesn't mean that all pastors are like that. Besides, even when a pastor is doing the wrong thing, God still gave us something to do. He said, you do this, so we are expected to obey God even in spite of uh, sinful people. Okay, so an offering is not just with money. God gives us so that we can give. He doesn't give us so that we can have all kinds of money and be happy. Because if you have money, you're going to want more money. And if you don't have money, you're going to want more money. Money is not happy with where it's at. Um, so anyways, uh, it's something given past the required 10%. Um, there is no phone the blank on your sheet on this one. In St. Corinthians chapter 9, uh, Paul talks about an offering, and he talks about how they have the choice to give it or not. Um, he is not talking about tithing. He's talking about an offering. Some people use St. Corinthians 9 to say, see, we're not no longer required for a tithe. But Paul's not talking about tithing. He's talking about giving an offering. Um, he actually makes that clear in uh, St. Corinthians chapter 9. So in Proverbs 22... And there's a lot of passages um, on your sheet for this one. I don't think we'll look at all of them. A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. Sometimes we think that money is just paramount to life, and it's just not. If we lose our money, worse things can happen. Giving financial tithes and offering is the first step. God expects us to give at least 10% of all we have from time to money. See, that's the first step, but God doesn't want us to stop there. Oh, well, I'm doing the very minimum that I can. You know, I, I'm paying my tithes. So I'm going to use the rest of my money however I want. Well, 
well, that's not really the idea. It's not, I'm paying this get out of jail free card so that I can go off and do whatever I want. Um, if we only give the bare minimum, we will lose opportunity. I mean, I could tell a lot of stories about that. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're real stingy with stuff, and so we give just barely what's required, and then we lose out on things that would have blessed us. And really, there are so many stories, and I, I don't want to take up any time, but we lose opportunity when we are stingy. When we are greedy, we lose opportunity to be blessed, to bless others. I mean, just so much. A slave doing his master's bidding is not worthy of double pay. What we do is we pay tithes and offering, and we say, okay, now, God, you are expected. Hey, we have an agreement here. I have given you money. Now you give me something. And if you're going into tithes and offering, you should keep on giving tithes and offering, but you should change that attitude too because God doesn't owe us anything. If he chose to take away all of our finances and all of our the things that we have, he could. Only th the only reason why you have anything from the breath you breathe to the clothes on your back is because God has blessed you with them. Um, so remember that we are not worthy of double pay simply for doing the bare minimum of what is required. If we give, give for the purpose of blessing, we miss the point. It's not all about us. So now let's look at just some financial understanding, um, how to have kind of one mind with Christ with our, with our money. First off, the fill in the blank, there is credit. Credit is hypothetical money temporarily um, uh, temporarily loaned to you. Okay. So in other words, I'm a bank and you are a person. You're saying, I want $20,000. And the bank says, yeah, hypothetically, we're giving you this, this money. The money doesn't really exist. It's just a, it's just a number on a page. And then you go and buy this, whatever is you're buying, you know, whatever. And so then the bank says, okay, now you're going to have to pay me. And so now you're giving them actual money for the hypothetical money that you borrowed. But now you have to pay them interest because you borrowed money that didn't actually exist in your account. Um, so then there's debt. Debt is the result of credit. <laughs> and here's the trick about debt. It makes you a slave to the creditor. You take out a credit card, you max it out. Now what? Now your finances go down, you ha you're spending all your time and energy paying off that credit card. Every penny that you make is going towards it. it you're, you're a slave to it. it. It's constantly on your mind. It weighs you down. Even if you decide not to pay your credit, your debts, which as a Christian, you, sh you should always pay off debts. We should be known by our word. The Bible is absolutely clear about this. But um, even when you decide not to pay off your debts, it will still weigh on your heart. Oh, no, I don't care. It changes the way you act. When you when you decide to go into debt and especially decide not to pay it off, it changes something in you. Um, I've seen it happen with a lot of people. Um, so then there's something called depreciating items. Now, depreciating items is anything which loses value with time. For instance, a car is a depreciating item. If you buy a car for, you know, 20000 within four to five years, it's going to be worth a fraction of that, but you're probably still going to be paying on your car loan. Now, what that means is you're going to be paying for something more, than, you're going to be paying more than the thing is actually worth, plus you're going to be paying, in, paying interest on top of that. So, whereas if you would have bought a new car, you would have maybe paid 8000 now you're paying for a brand new car at 24000 or whatever. And it's no longer even worth that, which means that if you try and sell the car to get out of debt, you're going to make less than you owe off the car. I hope that this is kind of making sense. Um, other depreciating items, um, obviously uh, anything that loses value with time. Um, clothes, <laughs> shoes, um, uh, houses, you know, things like that. So uh, then that takes us to... Um, oh, I'm sorry, there was a blank on there. So credit was the first blank under financial understanding. Anything which loses value with time. And then the next thing, um, interest, is that next fill in the blank. Interest is money charged for using money you didn't have. In other words, I need $10. So you go to the bank and get $10 that you do not have. And then they say, okay, but we're going to charge you to take this money that you didn't have. You can do it with um, getting money before a check, before you get the check. That costs money. You can do it with taking cash out from a credit card, spending on a credit card, taking out a loan, going to a, a title, you know, I don't figure what it's title for, um, title for cash place, you know, where you take your car's title in and they pay you, um, and then you have to pay an obscene amount of money to get your title back. I wish I could remember what that's what's that called, what that's called, but you know what I'm talking about. So that basically, in essence, makes a credit card nothing more than a covet card, and 
it, we teach to we, we learn to not have uh, you know financial stability for the sake of our desire. We want something, so we take it. But that's not really how life works. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. So how do you get financial freedom? Well, there's a few steps here. Okay, Financial freedom uh, comes through, give, through giving to God. That's step number one. The poor and fellow Christians. If you want to be financially free, give. We think, oh, I, I have to get financial Free, financially free by paying off all my stuff and by, no, stop wasting your money on, on stuff that doesn't matter. Start giving to God, the poor, and fellow Christians. And when I say give to the poor, I'm not saying throw money at, at, at beggars. I'm saying actually give to the poor. Maybe buy them a meal, maybe invite them to church, that kind of stuff. Um, then a, a second step, second step, persistently, um, Persistently working. Uh, in Second Thessalonians three seven through twelve, he talks about if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. In Matthew twenty five thirty one through forty six, let me get there real quick. Matthew twenty five thirty one through forty six. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another. And one shepherd, as sh one shepherd separates uh, the sheep from the goats. Now I want I want to stop here and, and point something out. God expects you to do what you can with what you have. You might say, "I don't have a lot of money." Okay, what do you have? And all of us have something that we can give. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, "Come, you who are blessed by my father." Then hop down. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. He didn't say anything about throw, just throwing money at a beggar. He said about providing the needs. Now, that's really giving. So financial freedom comes through giving. It comes through working. Sometimes we think that money is just going to fall in our lap. No, we are actually required to work for it. In Proverbs chapter 13, Especially as a Christian, you know, it's okay to get financial assistance from the government, but it's not okay to use that as an excuse to not work. Proverbs 13.11 says, Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. If you're telling the, the, um, the government, I need help, when you don't need help, you need to get off of your bed and work, then you are lying to the government. You might say, oh, well, you know, that's that's a victimless crime. Well, actually, it is a victimless crime. I mean, it is a victim crime because, A, you are becoming a liar, and you're also becoming an, a manipulator and a user. And besides all that, you are causing tax money to be drained from something where it could be benefit people, like maybe healthcare or something, to instead you being lazy. Now, I know it's hard to learn how to, you know, Take care of your finances, use your money wisely with your kids, work when you, especially as a single parent, it's very difficult to do those things, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Um, and so, okay, uh, persist persistently working. And the third, third area, wisely managing our accounts and belongings. Wisely managing our accounts and belongings. See, um, we actually are required to kind of learn from the process. Um, I have two passages there, Matthew 6, 33, and Luke um, 16, 10 through 13 and 15. Um, we're not going to look at those, actually. Uh, we're mostly just going to read the ones out of Proverbs. So, uh, God gives money to provide for needs. That's the first thing he provides money for. Uh, I mean, gives money for, providing for needs. God does see our needs. But sometimes he wants us to... Sometimes he, he'll give it, he'll fulfill our needs without the use of money. So keep an eye out for that. To confirm, to confirm his direction, if he tells you, hey, I want you to move, but he doesn't give you money to move, chances are it wasn't really him telling you to move. Just throwing that out there. I know sometimes people try to super spiritualize this. Oh, well, God just wants me to step out in faith. Yeah, but not really. Most of the time in the Bible, God tells people, to act with what they have and act wisely. So if God wants you to do something like that, he will confirm his direction with providing the money. Um, for us to give to others and 
to show his power in trying times. Those are the basic uh, reasons why God gives money. He doesn't just give us money so that we can have money and feel secure. Um, we're not going to read the passage in Psalms. So I, a need is something you must have in order to survive. Sex is not a need. Um, video games is not a need. Um, you know, having name brand clothes is not a need. A need is something you must have to survive. For instance, food, water, clothes, and they can be off-brand, and they can be um, hand-me-downs, and they can be from the thrift store. That's okay. And um, and his word. He, th those are the things that we need in our lives. We need those things. Which leads us to a very important point that we should always ask before spending any money. Don't ask, can I buy this? But should I buy this? If you look on your sheet there, the first is don't ask, can I buy this? But should I buy this? Um, is it a need or is it a want? And then base your decision off of that. So that takes us to Proverbs 13, 18, where it says, Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline, but he who regards reproof will be honored. Um, so that takes us to don't throw money away on wasteful or impulsive spending. Um, what is wasteful or impulsive spending? Impulsive spending is going on Amazon and just buying stuff. Uh, wasteful spending is just seeing something and buying it without any thought. You're at the store and you're not there for any purpose. You're just wandering down the aisle and you say, oh, I see this and I want it, so I'll buy it. That's wasteful spending. Anything, anytime that you're at the store, it should be to get something specific that you need, like food or groceries, okay? and then to leave. You should not be wandering the aisles, you shouldn't be wasting your money on stuff. Other examples, eating out. You can save a lot of money by not eating out. And you might say, oh no, I tried that. Trust, trust me, we save so much money not doing that. Alcohol. Alcohol costs a lot of money. I know people say, oh, well, it's not wrong for me to drink alcohol. Whatever, I don't care. I'm not going to argue that point with you. I just don't even care. The point is, it's not a wise use of your, mo of your uh, money. Um, running around. You see a lot of times people who don't have money driving their car back and forth. Do you really need to? Are you going to work? That's a need. <laughs> okay, uh, just running around to go to a friend's house, you can walk. Um, uh, buying stuff where you have to give payments. Um, like there's some furniture stores around here where you buy stuff on payments. Um, that's, that's wasteful because you're spending more than you actually would have to. So that takes us to Proverbs 21.17, and it says, He who loves pleasure will become a poor man. He who loves pleasure will become a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not become rich. See, there's kind of this mindset that goes with, with trying to please ourselves all the time, and it just causes us to find ourselves with no money. Um, I'm not going to look at the passage in well, yeah, I will. First Timothy 6.10. It says, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, not the root of evil, a root of all kinds of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and, perceive, and pierced themselves with many griefs. In other words, when you desire wealth in your heart, it causes you to do things that you shouldn't be doing. So, like still... So don't throw away money. What would you do if you had five thousand dollars in your bank account right now? This is a good. This is a good test of character. Would you instantly spend it? Would do you already have an area that it would go to, or would you invest it in something? If you had a credit card that had no limit, would you keep putting money on it, or would you only spend what you have? See, this is a really good test of character. So don't buy on impulse. There should be a thought process. First off, you should ask, should I should I buy this? And then you should save up your money. And then you should shop for a, a good price for it. And then you should buy. Which takes us to another important, important point. Wanting is not a reason. Wanting is not a reason. Just because you want something doesn't mean you should get something. Um, sometimes we tell ourselves, um, you know, oh, I... I have to have this. And we convince ourselves that oh, i just be so much happier with this. But A, you won't be happier with it. And B, you don't need it. 
So that you needs two things. First off is self-control, the ability to say no. And the second is discipline. We have to live a disciplined life with our money. I don't have the money for that, therefore I'm not going to waste the money on it. Don't just tell your kids, I don't have the money for that. Also tell them, I'm not going to waste the money on that. Because you need to teach them the same thing that you also need to learn. That money is meant to be handled well. Money is kind of like um, a hot potato. If you put it in your pocket, a lot of times people, well, I guess that's a bad analogy. Um, let me use two different analogies. Some people have holes in their pockets and it's just like money burns a hole. It just, it just can't stay there. If it's in their pocket, they got to spend it. Put it in the bank. And uh, it's kind of like a hot potato for some, you know. They just, they just can't, they just can't hold it. They, uh, they just got to do something with it. So with that being said, be aware of your money with problem with money, and get rid of your credit cards, and or learn how to how to manage this. See, disciplined living is a is a very important part of, of the Christian life. Um, so okay, I'm kind of just going off here. So let me get back on schedule. We'll get back on Proverbs 22:4. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. So let me see. Don't spend money you don't have. Buying a TV when you owe somebody else. Buying a TV when it's on purchase to, or, or payment to own. Uh, uh, when you have to, when you have to have multiple payments to have it. Have the money, give the money, own the thing. And then it can never be taken away, which is pretty cool. Um, well, except for when you die. <laughs> but also along with this, don't plan on money you don't have. On, on your sheet, it's only one point. Don't spend or plan on money you don't have. I separated them here to kind of elaborate more. Don't plan on money you don't have. Oh, well, I will be getting my um, tax refund or whatever. And I, I think it's going to be this much, so I'm going to go ahead and spend this money. And then when I get that money, I'll just pay off what I got. Not smart. You don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know if you miscalculated. You don't know if the interest is gonna is gonna be more than you can cover. You don't. Is there just so much, so much? Um, car payments is a great example. I'm going to buy this car, and I'm I'm guaranteeing the loan, the bank, that I'm gonna have um, a the money for the next three years. I, I'm, I'm guaranteeing the bank that because I'm taking out a loan on it. But what happens if you lose your job? What about credit buying? Like I already mentioned this, where you have a credit card and hypothetical money, and you're saying, okay, yes, I'm buying this, and you're acting like you actually have the money when you don't. Um, oh, well, I have a job, so I'm going to go ahead and spend the money before I've even gotten my first paycheck. Um, or, you know, oh, I'll find a job. Don't count on money that you don't have. Um, avoid get rich schemes. Oh, actually, let me read. Um, let me read a few passages. Thirteen seven, Proverbs thirteen seven, where it says, "There is one who pretends to be rich but has nothing. That person has a credit card. Another pretends to be poor but has great wealth. That's the person who says, I'm not going to waste my money on this.' See, rich people don't just throw their money away. Um, Proverbs twenty two. 26 through 27 says, Do not be among those who give pledges, among those who become guarantors for debt. I, I will, I guarantee that I'll be able to cover this. And you know what? If they don't cover it, I'll cover it for them. If you should, if you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? Why should you have to pay when you don't have money? Just, just don't, don't co-sign on other people's loans and don't take out your own lo loans. Um, so avoid get-rich schemes. There's always somebody who comes by with, oh, here's quick, easy, or free money. A, there's no such thing as free money. It has to come from somewhere. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. Um, second, there's really no way to get easy money. It's it's you work hard, you save up your money, you have money. It's that easy. It's not quick. It takes time and it takes discipline. And eventually, you get your you know you get your 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 stuff in order. And I've seen people who are dirty who are able to get jobs, so don't say, oh, well, I need to got, buy new clothes so I can get a job. I've seen people who don't have cars get jobs, so don't say, I have to buy a car before I can get a job. I've seen people who, y y there are jobs out there. I know sometimes we convince ourselves there is no, there are no jobs. That's just not true. You don't, you aren't looking in the right places. There's always jobs out there, because there's always people who don't want to work, and there's always people who need someone to work. 
Um, in construction, there was always a shortage of laborers. I haven't worked construction in a long time, but I do still know people who work construction, and there is still a shortage of workers. And that's just one area. Proverbs 10.16 says, The wages of the righteous is life, the income of the wicked punishment. See, sometimes we think that this blessing and righteousness and wealth that God is giving us is financial, but not necessarily. Um, in 15.27, it says... He who profits illicitly troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. Get honest money. Don't sell drugs to get money. Don't do all that kind of nonsense to get money. Work at a job. Money is earned through persistently working hard. That's how you get how you get wealthy. Uh, another little quick note here. Run from laziness. Laziness is not working when you can. I was talking to one guy and he said, I can't work. And I said, well, I see you walking all around town. If you're able to walk and to spend your days walking around town, you can work at a job. Um, you can work at a, at a, at a simple uh, a fast food place like a, a Subway or something like that. All you have to do is stand behind a counter and move a piece of bread and put stuff on the bread. Then you do go in the back and you do some, do some stuff like that. But if you put on your application, I can't lift heavy stuff or whatever, I mean, they're – They'll work around you. Most of the time, people are just happy to find someone who works. Um, so run from laziness. Um, not working. Another thing that lazy people do, they don't complete tasks. See, when, when we were in drugs, we didn't complete anything. We just kind of stuff just sat around. Um, we aren't in drugs anymore. We're saved now. Um, we got up late. We did whatever we wanted. That's lazy. We, we, we don't do that anymore. We had our head in the clouds. Oh, all these things that I could do, and 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 you gotta reel yourself back in. You're not in drugs anymore. You have to you have to consciously change the way you think. If, if I did it this way, it'd be quicker. Don't worry about quicker ways to do it. Just do it. Like for instance, now picking up pecans. Every fall, there's people who need pecans picked up, and you can find a job doing that. Now, what some people do is they spend more time thinking about how to pick up the pecan than getting on their knees and picking up the pecans. That's how you pick up pecans. You just do the work. Get your head out of the clouds. Stop thinking about better ways to do it and just do the work. Um, also, there's this idea that sometimes we get where we are a victim. People owe us. You have to get rid of that mindset. It doesn't matter what's happened to you in your life. It doesn't matter um, how you've been wronged. You are not a victim. And especially as a Christian, we're not victims anymore. You have to choose to get up and, and, and move on. Um, so Proverbs 6, 10 through 11 says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Give you, oh, just a little bit, just a little bit, and then we need a little bit more. I mean, think about what happens when you wake up in the morning. Your alarm goes off at, let's say, pff, I don't know, 6. Well, you hit the snooze, right? Well, then it's 6.15, oh, I'll just wake up later. Just a little bit more, just a little bit more. You have to nip it in the bud and, 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 and fight. Because if you don't fight for a disciplined life, you won't have a disciplined life. Um, everything you have is a blessing. God, people, and government don't owe you a single thing. That's just a fact of life. Proverbs 10.4 says, Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Get up and do the work, and, and, and you will have money. Um, so, some are made poor, some are made rich, but all must be content in Christ. Sometimes we have riches and we lose them. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have riches and we get them. But either way, we, we have to find our contentment in Christ, not in riches. And we have to be wise with what we have. But either way, God is the one who makes people rich and God is the one who makes people poor. So can you say if you have money that you've been blessed by God? Yes. And can you also say that if you're not poor that you've been blessed by God? Yes. Yes, because financial blessings are not the way to uh, happiness. Proverbs 22, 2 says... The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. And then in verse 9, He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives uh, for he gives some of his food to the poor. And then in verse 16, He who oppresses the poor to make more for himself or who gives to the rich will only come to poverty. Um, and then chapter 30, verse 7 through 9, I'm not reading the passage in Philippians, uh, but basically he says about how he can be content with whatever he has. Uh, chapter 30, verse 7 through 9 says, Two things I ask of you, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. 
Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I, uh, that I not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Don't make me rich or poor. So you cannot simply put your mind to becoming rich. Sometimes it doesn't matter what you do, you're just not going to be rich. And But here's the, here's the real kicker, and this is the fill in the blank. Wealth is not the goal. Wealth is not the goal. Be content with whatever you have. Uh, don't live paycheck to paycheck, where your paycheck is spent before you even get your next paycheck. That's called living paycheck to paycheck. What happens if your car breaks down? What happens if you lose your job? What happens if there's a medical emergency? If you live paycheck to paycheck, you're going to be... You're going to have to take out money for on a credit card because you don't have money. So then you're going to have money that you can't pay off because you're already living paycheck to paycheck. When if you just rework your finances, you can make do with what you got. So then that takes us to the idea of um, marriage. Wives, don't spend money without your husband's permission. Just don't, don't do that. Don't take the credit card and spend stuff behind his back. and Oh, well, I just did it. Don't. Just don't. Don't do that. The Bible talks about respecting and obeying your husband. Marriage is about you know unity, and if you're not respecting and obeying your husband, you're not contributing what God told you to to that to that marriage. Now, husbands, do not ignore your wife. Say, don't go behind them and say, you know what, I'm the head of this household. I can just decide. Once again, marriage is supposed to be about two people making a commitment to each other, and making decisions together. So do not ignore your wife's say Respect and love your wife. I mean, goodness sakes, respect and love your wife. Um, neither neither can make a decision on their own, neither husband nor wife. Listen to others' advice and be accountable for major purchases. Now this is just an incre incredibly important lesson. Listen to other people's advice. Do other people have any opinion on this? And don't ask people who aren't smart with their money. And don't ask people who are going to profit from your, from your unwise purchase. Ask people who actually care. Ask a pastor. You know, he's not invested in your finances. Um, well, I mean, invested in the way of, you know, trying to help you make better decisions, not invested in the way of, you know, trying to make a buck off of you. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. That is just an increasingly important um, lesson. Um, Proverbs 11.14, which is on your sheet, says, Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Get get other people's um, opinions. Don't just spend money behind everybody's back and do whatever you want. Don't do that. Be accountable for major purchases. If you're not smart with your money, give your credit card to someone who is and say, Look, I need to, I need to buy something and have, have run it to them. And then you'll learn self self discipline. Never co sign for a loan. Never give money to the irresponsible or to the lazy. God has a way of trying to get lazy and irresponsible people, irresponsible people to become wise, to, to, to learn, to become uh, you know responsible and not be lazy. And when we get in the way of that, God will remove blessings from us, so we can't get in the way anymore. What happens is oftentimes people who are in need, not always, but oftentimes people who are in need. Um, are in need because they won't um, submit their finances to God. They want to spend their money however they want. You give them five bucks, they already have it spent. It literally burns a hole in their pocket. So with that, give them the opportunities. For instance, if there's a lazy person who needs money, do this. I've got a job that needs done. I will pay you to do this job. That's okay because they have worked for it. Teach them how to be responsible. You're teaching them how to not be lazy. Uh, a lot of times we have people come to the church asking for money. Please don't give those people money. Um, you know, they, they they do drugs, they drink, they party, and then they want the church to pay for their pay, to pay for their bills. They have to learn how to manage their money because the church does not have resources to keep paying for other people to party. We are not their mom, and we are not called to pay people's bills. We are called to help people to mature in the Lord. So what do we use our money for? Uh, we do a lot of ministries for the community, if you if you noticed, uh, and that's what this church is about. We're about helping people and helping them to help themselves. We don't want to teach people how to be lazy. I mean, this, our community is already struggling with that. There's already a lot of people who could be working that don't. And when we try and talk to them, I know, I know I should be working, 
but if I work, I, I won't get my I won't get my uh, benefits from the government. Um, okay, so never co-sign or give money to the responsible or lazy. Second Thessalonians 3:11. Again, I have it on here again a second time, where he talks about uh, not giving money to people who don't uh, work. Proverbs 17:18 says this. Uh, um, a man lacking in sense pledges and becomes guarantor in the presence of his neighbor. Uh, uh, somebody who's not smart says that they'll co-sign on a loan. Um, so don't waste your resources on the stubborn and prideful. It's just a waste of your time and money. It's not. It's not. They're not going to learn anything. Proverbs 13:25 says, "The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. They always want more. They have and they want more. Money, food, pick." Whereas a righteous person says, no, I will only eat what I, what I, what I need, and then I will give to others. Um, it's a whole different mindset. See, it, in, our, in our minds, we want to take and give, and take and take and take. But in God's kingdom, he says, give and give and give and give. So God opposes those who are evil, and when people choose to live evil, he will oppose them, and they won't have the money. 1917 says... One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Very important to remember that God is the one who is in charge of finances. 22.1. A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Okay, so uh, make a flow chart of all your income and all your expenses. Cut out anything that's not necessary spending, things that are absolutely essential, and then prioritize it. Okay, so first off, uh, prioritize spending with a budget. First off, tithes. How much money do you own tithes? Um, expenses. How much money will it take for you to pay your rent, your bills, um, and your groceries for that month? Cut out all the non-essentials. Don't buy. Don't buy music. Don't buy movies. Don't don't rent stuff. Nothing. You don't need any of that stuff. Make do with whatever you got. Well, we'll be bored. I'm I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm sorry. Um. So and then if you have any if you have any money left over then that goes to savings. Make sure that every dollar goes somewhere. Don't have oh I have leftover money. Well then you did it wrong. Um, keep record of where your money goes. Every time that you spend something, write it down, add it up. At the end of every week, at the end of every month, how much money are you wasting? Um, the little things add up. Oh well, I just bought a stick of gum here and a candy bar here and a soda here and you don't need soda to live. You need water. Water's the thing that you need. And then when you get your finances in order, then every once in a while you can get a soda. But physically, sodas are terrible for your body, and then financially, it's just a waste of money. Cut out things that are not essential. Cigarettes. Cigarettes cost a lot of money. And if you stop wasting your money on them, you'll have more money to spend on other things. See, you only have so much resources, and you decide where they go. Well, do you want to waste all your money on, on things where you'll always be in need? Oh, well, if I get cigarettes, then I'll be happy. So you buy cigarettes, but you don't have money, and you're not happy. So um, uh, save coupons. Uh, go through the through the uh, newspaper, stuff like that. Find coupons. Uh, there's a lot of coupons online. Go to the library if you don't have a computer. You don't have to buy a, a really expensive phone. In fact, I encourage you not to buy a really expensive phone because they break. Why waste your money on that? Um, don't shop hungry. If you are hungry, you should not be, should not be shopping for groceries. You're going to buy a bunch of crap that you don't need. Um, so, uh, um, wasteful spending or unnecessary spending is the, is the fill in the blank there, either or. Um, and on the one before that is accountable for major purchases. So, um, free money doesn't exist. Someone always has to pay somewhere. The church is not a bank. If just because you gave doesn't mean that they have to bail you out of a financial pickle that you got yourself in. You should have in your savings account, you should have enough money to pay for six months of not having a job so that that will give you six months to get back in, into your into your uh, rut of working and, and, and so on. Now, this is not going to be accomplished in a day. Don't get discouraged. Do what you can now, and God, God has a way of just directing. We stress ourselves out, but if you just submit to his way, start doing what he told you to do, pray to him and say, Lord, I'm really trying to work things around. He'll open a an opportunity for a job. He'll open. He'll open up doors. Um, 
Lack of finances can be caused by not working. That's a big cause. By bad stewardship, when you have money, you just waste it. Um, by disobedience, not, not obeying God and how he told you to spend your money. By sinfulness, uh, by you know just living life your own way where God withholds money. And yes, there are a lot of times where, where, where um, lack of money is not from these things. It's, remember, God made the rich and the poor. So uh, there are other reasons too. Everything we do reflects either positively or negatively on God and his kingdom. Now, do you want to spend your money in a wise way or in a not wise way? Um, Matthew 6.21, I'm not going to read that. Um, let's keep going. So on your sheet there, there um, that should be all of that. Um, make a flow chart of total income and expenses. Cut um, no unnecessary spending or wasteful spending, either or. Um, prioritize spending with the budget. Tie as many expenses. Keep record of where your money goes. Save coupons. Don't shop hungry. Free money doesn't exist. Uh, someone always has to pay. The church is not a bank. On your sheet there, the church is not a bank. Proverbs 11.4. Which we already looked at, so I'm not going to look at it again, but we'll go 11.15. He who is guarantor for a stranger will surely suffer for it, but he who hates being a guarantor is secure. You are secure if you don't waste your money on that. It's very important. So what is the fear of the Lord? Um, well, actually, hold on. If you go back on your sheet, I, I'm sorry, I did miss one. Um, Lack of finances, not working, um, bad stewardship, disobedience, sinfulness. Proverbs 10.3. The Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger, but he will reject the craving of the wicked. Um, part of getting your finances in, in order is surrendering your life to God. Everything we do reflects either positively or negatively on God. On God. And his kingdom, but you're not going to be able to fit both of that in there, so you can just put God. Luke chapter 19, 11 through 27, um, talks about uh, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself, and then return. He called ten. Uh, he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas, and said to them, "Do business with this until I come." Um, but they didn't do it wisely. You can read through the story on your own. Uh, but then on at the end there, um, I tell you that to everyone who has more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he has, what he does have shall be taken away. And there's also another story um, that's in the Bible where uh, God gives um, some of his servants some money, and they all spend it differently. And and one of them, one of the servants, just holds on to it, doesn't. Doesn't lose it, doesn't make any more with it, and and God judged him because he didn't um, he didn't do anything with it. So what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is submitting to instruction. The fear of the Lord is not living not for yourself but for God, because if I fear God, I will obey Him. If I trust that He is a rewarder for those who do what He says and a punisher for those who disobey, then I fear the Lord. I believe Him. And I respond. So this is how a flowchart looks like. Um, here's your expenses here. Okay. You take the highest bill that you've had, then you add 10% to that. Always overbid your expenses. Okay, so here's your tithes and offering. That's the top. Electricity, let's say it's normally five and normally fifty dollars. Okay, so make it fifty-five dollars. You add ten percent. Uh, gas, let's say it's normally forty, add uh, Let's see, 40, let's just say 45. Um, you see what I mean? So gas, car insurance, water and trash, clothes, credit card debt, mortgage. See what I mean? You had your bills, then your debt, and that's your total. Now after that is this is your savings. So then you take your, your income and you underbid your income. What's the lowest check that you've gotten? Put that on there, okay? Um, so just a few a few words about finding a job. First off, you can find a job. Don't give up. The biggest problem towards finding a job is when we just give up. Just keep looking. You can find one. What if you lose your job? Ooh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Don't quit a job for another job. Boy, oh boy.
If you lose your job, what will happen to your finances? And be real with yourself because sometimes we have what we see as constants in our life. This will never change. This will never change. But be aware that people do lose their jobs. Always set aside money and savings for emergencies. That way you don't have to spend it on a credit card. That way you don't have to um, you know, borrow from all kinds of people. You have the money. Only spend on credit card when you uh, what you already have. Don't double spend. What people do is they say, okay, I have $20. I will spend $20 on the credit card, but then I will also spend this $20 too. You double spent the money. Instead, say, okay, I have this $20, so I will spend the money on the credit card, then I will pay it off before the end of the month. Why? Because your bank will actually pay you for having a credit card if you pay it off every every month. Um, don't double spend. Okay, cars depreciate faster than you buy them. I already mentioned this. Keep receipts and add up how much you spend eating out. You'd be surprised how much money you waste. If you took every single year, for 15 years, you added $1,000 of debt. That's not that much. Interest is $120. Your total debt at the end of the first year is $1,120. At the end of the 15th year, you owe $41,754. $41,754. Just by adding one thousand dollars of debt, you might say, "Would well, shouldn't that add fifteen thousand? It's more than double, almost triple the amount of money that you actually borrowed in a loan because of interest." And remember, interest adds. So let's break this down: debt increased by one thousand dollars every year at twelve percent fixed interest compounded annually. Okay, that means it's added together at annually. The interest is figured on, on how much you owe at the end of every year. So. Um, the more debt, basically, this is simplified here. The more debt you owe, the more interest is charged per year. So if you continually not pay, the in, you'll be paying interest on interest, if that makes sense, because the interest will, will add to the total that you borrowed, plus you didn't pay it, so then that you, you're uh, charged interest on, on the interest that's already added, and it just keeps on um, compounding and going on uh, more and more and more. Um, so then uh, $26,754 of interest in 15 years. That's just interest, okay? Wow. Wow. Okay? More than the total money borrowed almost by twice. So then you add it to the money that was borrowed. This brings the total you owe to $41,754. Wow. That's painful. You can buy on your credit card and pay it off every month and earn rewards, but you need to practice self-control. You cannot have everything you want or see. Being good with money is not mystical. It is simply having discipline over your financial decisions. You don't. Your money doesn't own you. You own your money. Don't don't, don't mix it up. So if you pay six thousand dollars a year on that debt that I mentioned, the, the forty-one thousand dollar debt, it will take sixteen more years to pay it off. It took you fifteen years to get the debt. It's going to take you more than that just to pay it off. If you pay six thousand dollars a year. You will end up paying $53,696 more on interest. You will pay a grand total of $80,000, $450 in interest. $80,450 in interest. That means the grand total of what you would have paid is $80,000 plus the fifteen. dollars That takes us to almost $100,000. So that 1,000 doesn't sound like a big deal. And you might say, well, 12% 12 12 interest, that's not – I could get better than that. Uh, no, you can't. That's how much credit cards cost. Um, on a really good uh, house mortgage, you get probably like, I don't know, 3.5%, I guess. Is, that's, that's, that's really good. You're probably not going to get that. But, I mean, let's just assume you do. That's on a house mortgage. This is a 30-year mortgage. So 3% of you know $80,000, well, actually, that is quite a bit of money. But on credit cards, your interest rate is going to be a lot higher. And on those places um, where you sell your title, you're actually going to be accumulating interest faster than you can pay it off. Um, so some questions to ask anytime that you're taking out a loan of any kind from any source. Is the loan fixed rate? Will the rate change? What is the interest rate? You should know and you should be able to figure it out. Ask them to type you up a list of what it will look like. How long will it take me to pay that off if I'm paying this much? How is the interest figured? Monthly, daily, annually. Annually means every, at the end of every year. Monthly is at, at the end of every month. Uh, daily is, is bad. Daily is very bad. That means at the end of every, of every day, which means it's going to add up faster. So uh, what is the repayment length? Um, on a typical house mortgage, for instance, it's going to be 30 or 15 years, depending on which type you get. 
Um, on a credit card, it'll typically be about three years. Uh, school loans are usually about 12 years. Um, it, it really just depends on how much money you took out. Um, what is How long will it take you to repay it? How much will you end up paying in total? Is there another way to, 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 to get this thing that you supposedly need? How much will you pay on interest? How much will your payments be with insurance and maintenance? I'm going to buy a new house that's going to solve all my problems. Houses cost a lot of money. You have to pay for insurance, flood insurance, for fixing things. When you rent, if something breaks, you just tell the landlord. How much will your payments be with insurance and maintenance? And I just want to say this. If you are going from rental to rental and you're constantly getting kicked out, and so you, you move into another apartment and you get kicked out, you move into another one, you are stealing from the landlord. See, he owns that house, and he's you are paying him in order to live there, and you are not giving him the money. So don't tell people that the landlord is just a jerk and talk behind his back. That's not a Christian thing to do because it's your fault. It's your fault you get, got kicked out, not the landlord's. A landlord's not going to kick you out for paying the money. Now, there are slumlords. They do exist, and you do have to watch out. But with that being said, the majority of what I hear in this area is where people ripped off their landlords, they didn't pay rent, and then they got mad at the landlord that they kicked them out. So just a side note there. How much will your payments be with insurance and maintenance? How much of your payment goes to the principal and how much goes to the interest? See, they, they can break up your payment, and you can just be paying on interest month after month. Be aware of that. Can you afford it? If you're taking out a loan, you probably can't afford it. <laughs> if you could afford it, you would need to take out a loan. Uh, and then the next question, do you need it? Do you need it? Remember what we were talking about separating from wants from needs. Now, I know this was a lot of information.